I've heard you smart. Mm. Print media. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay, guys. One more day. Two more nights. Then I can get of you. Okay. Yes. We are continuing our daily day class thinking style evening lectures. But I heard you get good night all the We have a new professor at EGS. I met him 20 years ago. He will not remember outside the Collège International de Philosophie, together with my old friend and publisher, Peter Engelmann. I only remember him smoking all, all the time. No, I never smoke. <laughs> that is what I remember. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. But, but, but it, it was a counterfeit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he, in the last years, his books has been translated into English, and that is how I got his name back from the artist in New York. There is a thinker, politics and aesthetics, who has a new approach. To these old uh, questions that they told you, who? Ancien? Not sure? Mm. Yes, they said, yes, <laughs> it's him. Okay, I said, let's try. And I asked Judith to help me out here. And he, people told me he sometimes says yes and later no again because somebody bad in his family happens. <laughs> I just thought, okay, let's get his wife with him so <laughs> that he cannot bail out. So welcome his wife, I don't know if she's here, but she is the reason why he is actually here. <laughs> so welcome. <laughs> You may thank the Volcan Schirmacher for this invitation. Well, uh, I must make a preliminary statement, you know. The scope of my lecture today will be much more restricted than the scope of the lectures you heard, uh, you heard uh, today, today and, the day, and the day before. Though, in, in a sense, it will also deal with negation and with some perplexities of the last century. But I shall do it from a much shorter angle, so, which means that my lecture will not deal with disaster, but with vertigo. More precisely, with cinematographic vertigo. In fact, I will offer some reflections about the relationships between two movements. First, the visual unfolding of the images that is specific to cinema. Second, the process of the process of unfolding and dissipation of the appearances which pertains more widely to the art of narrative plots. We know that here in our Western tradition the art of narration has been governed mostly by the Aristotelian logic of the plot as a plot <coughs> as a logic of reversal which means there is a certain concatenation of actions which apparently carries a certain meaning and leads to certain ends. But at a certain point, everything appears to be reversed. Knowledge becomes ignorance, ignorance becomes knowledge. Success is turned into failure or unhappiness into happiness. So the issue I will address is as follows. What kind of relation is there exactly? between the cinematographic deployment of the appearances and this classical narrative logic which leads to the, to the revelation of the truth of the appearances. I try to show that the most perfect adjustment of these two movements still implies a gap and to understand the philosophical signification and the political issue at stake in this gap. So this talk will deal with the relationships between seeing, movement, and truth. By the same token, it will deal with some relationships between cinema, philosophy, literature, and communism. I'll start with an author and a film that apparently present us with the most perfect adjustment between the cinematographic movement of the images and the narrative revelation of a truth hidden by the images. The author is Alfred Hitchcock, 
a filmmaker, a filmmaker who proved able to match at the highest degree the deployment of visual images and the narration of plots constructed in accordance with the Aristotelian idea of the plot. The film is Vertigo, a film which is regarded with some good reasons as the top of Hitchcock's art. For those who may have forgotten the film, I will remind very shortly the plot. The story of Vertigo is about a former policeman, Scotty, played by James Stewart, who suffers from acrophobia. A friend of him asks him to trail his woman, Madeleine, who he says is mentally possessed by the spirit of an ancestor who committed suicide and is tempted to imitate her by committing suicide. As Scotty's, as Scotty's, you know, does it and witnesses the veracity of Madeleine's attraction for, for death, he also, he also falls in love with her. He saves her when she jumps into the water, but when she leads him to the bell tower of a church, he will be unable to follow her because of his acrophobia. And he will just see the body falling from the tower. Well, long after, he meets a girl, Judy, who looks like Madeleine, and he wants to shape her to the exact image of his dead love. But in the process of this transformation, he will discover that the whole story was a manipulation imagined by the husband to kill, to kill his wife. The woman Scotty had followed, in fact, was Judy, playing the role of Madeleine, and the simulated suicide was the true murder of the true Madeleine. As I said, the logic of the unfolding of the images first seems to match exactly the narrative logic. The logic of the film is encapsulated as soon as the credits appear on the screen by abstract spirals designed by Saul Bass to connect the images of, the, of a lying mouse, an enigmatic eye, and a fascinating bun. So, so even before the story begins, we are already provided with the visual formula of the narrative logic that will make three kinds of vertigo coincide. Scotty's acrophobia, the manipulation set up by the murderer, and the visual fascination of Scotty for the fake Madeleine. From this point on, the whole visual dispositif is designed to serve first the success of the machination, then its disclosure. In the first time, so, the mise en scène is entirely designed to enhance, enhance the deception of a look, starting from an episode in a restaurant where the profile of the fake Madeleine appears, detached from the env environment as both a profile of ideal beauty and the cipher of a secret. This apparition initiates the reversal that will transform the gaze of the detective investigating the woman's alleged fascination for her ancestor into a gaze itself fascinated by this apparition. Then the second half of the film takes the opposite way. The evolution of Scotty's illness now coincides with the disclosure of the truth about Madeleine's faked illness. As Scotty shapes Judy in the image of Madeleine, he understands that Madeleine was just a role played by Judy. The achievement of the visual fascination leads to the revelation of the intellectual machination. So the, and the romantic scenario of the man fascinated by an image come to be exactly submitted to the Aristotelian plot of recognition. This perfect adjustment, however, conceals a gap. Now the point is to know what it exactly consists in. Because we know that there exists a very famous interpretation of this gap, which has been provided by Gilles Deleuze <coughs> in the movement image. Gilles Deleuze makes Hitchcock's cinema a turning point in the history of cinema, both the peak of the movement image system and the symptom of, of its crisis. According to Deleuze, Hitchcock invented in cinema the mental image. Now, mental image means two things. On the one hand, it is a sort of super image encompassing all others. Hitchcock integrates action images, perception images, and affection images into a set of relations that frames and restages them. But on the other hand, the mental image is the image that breaks down the oriented schema of the, <coughs> of the movement image, which was the schema of the movement responding to another movement. Scott is acrophobic.